Hello, everybody. This is XNT 401, Build High Performance .NET Serverless Architectures on AWS. My name is Andy Hopper, and I'm a Principal Specialist Solutions Architect here at AWS. In this session, we're going to be covering a number of topics. We're going to discuss Lambda infrastructure and how it executes your code. We're going to talk about how you can actually measure the performance of your code, which is always important when you're trying to tune things. We're going to talk about how to use our knowledge of the way Lambda runs our code to optimize our code to get the best performance and the best price performance ratio. Then we'll talk about everyone's favorite topic when it comes to .NET code, cold starts. And then finally, I'll have some tips and tricks, you know, hints for how to get the most out of the Lambda platform while you're building your serverless applications. And then because, you know, theory is awesome, I think practice really helps to, you know, help people understand the way to do this. So I've got a, quite a few demos that will actually walk you through implementing some of the things that we're going to be talking about in this session. So let's discuss how Lambda actually runs your code. So let's take a look at this slide and we're going to go from right to left here. So first, you're going to provide your code to the Lambda service. You can do this either through a zip file, and that's the actual original way you provided your code to Lambda when it first was launched. However, in reInvent of 2021, we introduced the capability for you to provide a Docker image for Lambda to run your code. Regardless of which approach you take, Lambda will then deploy your code to Lambda instances. And the number of instances that get spun up is going to depend very heavily on how your Lambda function is actually being triggered. And that's where those event sources come in. Those event sources can come from a variety of places. It could be an HTTP REST request coming from API Gateway. It could be a change to state in, say, like a DynamoDB table. Or you can even have it uh, respond to changes inside your AWS environment. And then finally, of course, like everything else in AWS, there is an API for Lambda. So if you need to, you can directly invoke it if you want to. Now, under the covers, what Lambda is actually doing with your code is deploying it to instances that are running on Firecracker VM. Uh, so if you weren't already aware of this, this is actually a very high performance, very low memory footprint uh, VM technology that AWS developed. We've actually open sourced it. And so if you look at the bottom of the slide, you'll see a link to the GitHub repository that actually has this code. But at the end of the day, what we're trying to do with Firecracker is provide a very high performance, very high security, multi-tenant infrastructure for executing your code. Now, when it comes to the actual deployment of your code, you do have a wide variety of approaches. Like I talked about earlier, it ranges all the way from a zip file to an image, but there are steps in between. So, if, and you'll notice, if you look at the arrow I've got on the right-hand side, I'm kind of illustrating you know, what the trade-offs are here. So if you want to have the highest deployment speed and the least amount of management you have to perform yourself, go with the zip file approach. It's very lightweight. It's very quickly deployable into your Lambda infrastructure. And all you'll do is take your .NET applications assemblies, package them up as a zip file, and then hand them off to the Lambda service for deployment. However, you know, we, while I would never understand why someone would want to run any other runtime other than .NET and C Sharp, if you do need to provide a custom runtime, you can actually deliver that as a zip file as well. Uh, in that case, what you're doing is you're actually packaging up all the code necessary to run your application's code, and then you'll provide an image that's got a special file called Bootstrap. This is what gives Lambda a mechanism to actually start up your runtime and execute your code. However, sometimes you may also want to engage in code reuse. And so rather than having to deploy the same set of assemblies to every single zip file that you're packaging up to Lambda, you may want to have a way to have a reusable package. And this is where Lambda Layers comes in. You can actually take multiple assemblies, whatever resources you want to provide to multiple Lambda functions, package that up as a layer, and then reuse that for multiple Lambda functions. But then finally, if you want to have complete control over the execution environment, you still can provide a Docker image 
to Lambda. It can be up to 10 gigabytes in size, and you've got complete control over the execution environment. You can supply the runtime framework, you also supply the code, any other binary assets that you'd like to supply to the actual code itself, and then Lambda will simply execute that image for you. Uh, that being said, again, looking at the arrow, a zip file is the fastest way to deploy your code, while an image is going to just take a little bit longer, especially if that image size is particularly large. Now, let's talk about, before we get into you know, the, the nuts and bolts of tuning, how we can actually measure what we're doing with that tuning. And there are multiple ways to track the performance of your Lambda. Uh, you've got CloudWatch and CloudWatch metrics. You have a great service of ours called AWS X-Ray. And then we have another service that's called CodeGuru Profiler. And again, uh, I don't understand why you'd ever want to use a technology other than c and .NET. Uh, however, CodeGuru Profiler currently today only supports the Java and Python runtimes. So we're not going to dig too deep into that today. But do understand, CodeGuru Profiler does have a way to get very detailed instrumentation of the performance of your Lambda function. But let's talk about the other two real quick. So with CloudWatch, first and foremost, CloudWatch support comes out of the box with your Lambda. All you need to do is ensure that your Lambda has the basic Lambda execution policy enabled on the role that your Lambda is executing on, and it can immediately start logging the details of your execution to CloudWatch log streams. Now, out of the box, this will include some fairly useful metrics. You'll get things like the duration of your execution, what the build duration is. If you want to include any log details, you can either use the logger that's present on the iLambda context object that the Lambda runtime hands you, or you can simply log to the console object, and it'll get rerouted into your log stream. Uh, however, you may find that you want to get more detailed information. If duration is not sufficient, you want to hear more about you know, what kind of network throughput you get, what kind of memory consumption your Lambda is using. Uh, this is where CloudWatch Lambda Insights comes in. Uh, so this is enabled by incorporating a Lambda layer, like I was talking about earlier, that incorporates the Lambda Insights monitoring infrastructure. And it's able to capture more detailed runtime data without you having to expressly do anything inside your Lambda itself. Finally, a really cool feature that we've recently added to CloudWatch is something called CloudWatch Synthetics. Now, ostensibly, this is the sort of thing you'd use almost like a health check, right? It's a way for you to verify the functionality of your application. And what you'll do is you'll set up something called a canary. This is an endpoint that Synthetics will invoke for you. You can actually set the granularity all the way down to one minute to just verify your Lambda functions working. However, Synthetics can also capture metrics like latency. So it's a fantastic way for you to be able to verify that your Lambda is responding or performing uh, to the metrics that you'd like for it to. Now, X-Ray, again, is a great service for actually monitoring the performance of your Lambda. Uh, and the way you'll use it is you'll actually enable tracing. Uh, and that depend where you enable that tracing depends on how you want to invoke your Lambda. You can either enable active tracing directly on your Lambda if it's responding to like an event that's happening in your AWS infrastructure. Or if you're having an API gateway that's going to be backed by Lambda, you can simply enable active tracing on your API gateway endpoint. Uh, however, that being said, what X-Ray will then do is actually gather what are called traces of the actual execution of your code paths, all the way down from your origination point through your Lambda itself. And if you actually enable X-Ray tracing inside your Lambda for any AWS services that you'll be invoking, it can also even track the performance of the calls that you make to services like DynamoDB, S3, etc. Uh, incidentally, for .NET, there are also X-Ray uh, handlers for invoking SQL Server. So if you want to see what your most frequently executed queries are, what the performance metrics are on those queries, you can let X-Ray include those in the traces so you can help even tune your underlying database layer. So with all this in mind, let's talk about how we can put all this in practice and actually optimize our Lambda code to get the most performance. So the first thing we should be paying attention to is you know, how the lifecycle of Lambda actually works. So I mentioned you're going to provide a zip file, you're going to provide an image, and as Lambda is spinning up instances of your code, the very first thing it's going to do is actually initialize your application's code. 
Uh, the very first thing it's going to do is you know in initialize any extensions, any underlying runtime that your code is using, and then finally it'll actually prepare your function for execution. And this is typically where you see a lot of that cold start time being spent is just getting your execution environment up and running. And for languages like .NET and Java, uh, that does mean that there's going to be a certain amount of time spent loading your assemblies or jar files into memory so it can actually prepare to execute your code. Once it's actually performed the initialization, then it's actually going to execute the code inside your function handler. And any code that's in that code path is going to get executed on every single invocation of your Lambda. And we're going to be paying attention to that in just a couple of seconds here. And then lastly, you know, if you're finally you know, preparing to deliver a new version of your Lambda or your Lambda has been quiesced because there have been no events coming in after a period of time, it will then shut down the execution environment. However, for the purposes of this session, we're going to be focusing primarily on that initialization and the invocation uh, aspects of the lifecycle. Now, let's use our knowledge about that initialization phase to talk about what we can do to take advantage of it. Uh, so when Lambda is spinning up an instance of your code, it's only going to execute that initialization once, and that is once per instance of your Lambda, and that's very important. If there are multiple instances of your, of your Lambda, each one of those instances will have the initialization phase get, get executed on it. But again, for each of those instances, it is only executed one time. This is a fantastic place for you to do any preloading of data that your Lambda is going to be needing. And we'll be taking a look at what that can look like in just a moment. In addition, in non-provision concurrency environments, and we'll talk about provision concurrency in a few slides here, uh, your Lambda function will actually get a temporary CPU boost in order to help accelerate the process of initialization as instances are being spun up. So let's take a look at a demo for how we can actually leverage that early initialization in our code. All right, so what I have here is my development box, and I've installed Visual Studio 2019. I've also installed the AWS Toolkit for Visual Studio. With that AWS Toolkit comes a couple of project templates, one of which is a serverless application template. And I've used that serverless application template to create a couple of sample projects that we'll be using to explore the concepts we're talking about in this session. So for early initialization, what I've done is I've provided two implementations of what are functionally the same Lambda. I've got an unoptimized implementation and an optimized one. So let's take a look at the unoptimized code first. What I'm doing in here is inside my Lambda handler, I'm fetching some configuration elements that I'll be using inside my mission critical code. So I'll be fetching some data from systems manager. I'm using the simple systems manager client to interact with parameter store. And then I'm using a secrets manager client to fetch a secret from secrets manager. For these two, you can think of the parameters as things like debug flags, feature flags, what have you. Uh, and for secrets manager, this is typically things like connection strings for databases and what have you. But one thing you'll notice is I'm actually invoking the fetches for these parameters and the secrets manager secret in every invocation of my Lambda function. So let's take a look at how I refactored this code to optimize it. So again, using the knowledge that we've got about the early initialization of my Lambda, what I've done is I've moved the fetching of those configuration values out of the body of my Lambda handler and into its own dedicated function, which I've named fetch configuration. And then what I've done is I'm actually invoking that fetch configuration call inside the constructor of my Lambda class. And what I'll then do is actually cache the values that I fetched inside some member variables that I've got declared inside that Lambda class. But then if you'll scroll down a bit and look, you'll see that now my Lambda handler is quite tight. I no longer am doing all those fetches of those configuration values on every single invocation of my Lambda. Now, in order to be able to compare these side by side, what I've done in my serverless template is I've set up two API gateway stages and I've enabled active tracing on both of those stages so that X-Ray can actually show them side for me in the X-Ray service map. So to look at those, I'll go into the Explorer 
and I'll pull up CloudFormation. And as you can see, I've got my early initialization stack deployed. So I'll go ahead and click on that. And if we look in the, let's close this. If we look in the outputs tab, you'll see I've got a couple of URLs for the unoptimized and optimized endpoints. And then I've got a, a shortcut link to snap to service map for it. Let's go ahead and gather some data so I can display it inside X-Ray. First, I'm going to click on the URL for the unoptimized Lambda. So the first time it gets invoked, of course, I'm hitting a cold start. We will be talking about cold starts in a little bit. But now you can see the data that I've fetched from my uh, parameters inside Parameter Store. I'll invoke it a couple of times just to give X-Ray a few additional data points. Great. So let's go back to Visual Studio. And I'll click the link for the Optimize Lambda. And likewise, now you may already notice just by the naked eye that the response time on that optimized lambda seems suspiciously faster than that unoptimized one. However, we'll let the X-ray service map be the final arbiter. So I'll go ahead and click the link to pull up the X-ray service map. So what I have here is the X-ray service map, which is showing data from the invocations of my lambda handlers. And I'm going to move this just over a bit so you can see it better. But you may notice that in the legend here, size of the nodes reflects the average latency uh, of the invocation on those nodes. And you may notice just by comparing these that one set of nodes is quite a bit larger than the other. So let's double click on this and find out why. So first I'll click on the larger node, which is our unoptimized function. And you'll see the average latency is around 2.17 seconds per invocation. And, you know, I ran it four or five times, so that's slightly skewed by the uh, cold start time, but it's still a pretty healthy average on the overall execution time. Next, let's click on the smaller node, which is our optimized Lambda function, and let's click there. What we see now is that the average latency for that function is around 325 milliseconds. So that's a, what, roughly 75% decrease in the latency of my Lambda simply by taking that repetitive code that was fetching values from Parameter Store and Secrets Manager up into the constructor of the Lambda. So again, in this case, what we're doing is we're leveraging our knowledge of how our Lambda execution environment gets spun up in order to optimize our execution speed and also therefore the amount of money we're paying for the execution of our Lambda. Okay, let's get back to the presentation. All right, so now that we understand what we can do to tweak our code to get the most performance out of our Lambdas, let's look at some other ways where we can accelerate the actual processes inside our handlers. And by that, I'm talking about trying to maximize the overall throughput. Again, depending on the size of your Lambda, you're going to be determining how much CPU resources that your Lambda will actually have at its disposal. One thing you can do with that is leverage uh, the new capability in C Sharp and .NET of async await. Uh, the nice thing about async await is that it is allowing you to offload I.O. intensive operations that can happen in an asynchronous fashion into the background while your code proceeds. Uh, these are going to be things like database queries, uh, disk I.O. if you have to load a large file from disk. It can be calls into the AWS SDK. If you've paid attention to the class frameworks that we have in the SDK, you'll notice that all of our code in .NET uses async for invoking underlying Lambda functions. And if you've got any other code inside your own Lambda function that can also be offloaded and run in the background, that's also a phenomenal opportunity for le to leverage async await. And with all that in mind, what you can do is identify code paths that are not dependent upon one another and execute them in parallel. Uh, and one way to accomplish this is to use existing capabilities inside the .NET framework, such as, excuse me, inside the .NET Core runtime, such as queue user work item, or even the parallel for each framework for running multiple tasks that are independent of one another in parallel with one another. Now, one thing I do want to point out with using task-based code, you're going to benefit the most 
when your Lambda has access to more than one virtual CPU. And for those of you who are, are not yet aware of how Lambda you know, handles CPU capacity on it, that's going to be tied very closely to the amount of memory that you allocate to your Lambda. So in general, if you're allocating about a, a gig and up, you're going to be giving your Lambda access to more virtual CPUs, and therefore you can parallelize more tasks more easily. So let's actually take a look at how we can structure our code to benefit from that parallelization. OK, so we're back to our development machine. And what I'll do is move to my second set of examples, which is the async await functionality. Now, in this case, I've got a single function. But what I've done is I've actually provided two implementations of my handler. I've got a sequential API handler, and then I've got a parallel one. So let's take a look at the implementation of the sequential handler first. Now, in this case, what I'll be doing inside my Lambda's code is I'm fetching some data from DynamoDB. So this is actually something that's necessary to the execution of the Lambda. What I'm doing is I'm pulling uh, data out of four DynamoDB tables based on some runtime data that I'm being handed with the invocation of my Lambda. In this case, what, I'm, what I'll be doing is fetching some data from a user profile data uh, table for things like, you know, Know, email address, phone number, icon for their uh, for their avatar, that sort of thing. I'll also be pulling out roles to help me decide what kind of role-based access control I'll be using inside the application. And then later for like toolbar uh, you know, presentation, I'll be pulling like the list of open jobs that they've got uh, to help them snap to something they've uh, recently been working on or look at the current status. And I've also uh, fetched some data from a recently visited table in case I wanted to give them a breadcrumb trail to snap back to the most recently visited set of uh, pages on my site. Now, what you'll see is because, you know, the DynamoDB API and .NET is a async, I'm using the async await operators to be able to fetch the data from these DynamoDB tables. And if you pay attention to the code, what I'm doing is I'm first fetching the data from my profile, then I'm fetching the data from roles, then I'm fetching the data from open jobs, and then finally I'm fetching the data from recently visited. But the use of my await keyword here means that each of these fetches has to wait for the previous one to complete before it can begin. So it has serialized or made the access of the data inside those DynamoDB table sequential. Now what I've done with the parallel implementation is I'm leveraging the fact that tasks can actually execute side by side. So rather than injecting my await key keyword here, these are four completely independent fetches. I don't have any of these that depend on data from the previous ones. I'll actually just get the task from the fetch on each of those. And then what I'll use is the task when all function in order to coalesce all of the fetches and wait until they all return. Once they've returned, I'm then able to easily fetch the data using the result property on the task. Now, just like my early initialization Lambda, uh, what I've done is I've spun up a CloudFormation template that is deploying those async await functions uh, as different API gateway stages. And so what we'll do, just like with early initialization, I'll go ahead and click on the URLs just to demonstrate how these work. I'll pull up the sequential. And just as I did earlier, I'll run those a couple of times just to give X-Ray a, a few additional data points. Great. So let's go back to Visual Studio. And I'll do the same thing for the parallel invocation. And I'll run that a few times. Great. So let's go ahead and we'll go back to our Visual Studio and we'll pull up the X-Ray service map. So just as before, I've got my X-Ray service map for both of my invocations. I'm going to go ahead and scale this down a little bit just to make it a little more easily visible. And it may be a little harder to see the difference between these. The difference is going to be subtle. But again, I've also got it to where the bubble size is indicating the latency. 
But let's go ahead and look at our sequential invocation first. As you can see here, the latency on average is about 671 milliseconds when I'm fetching the data from DynamoDB. It is a relatively fast API. But if we take a look at the parallel invocation, we'll see that my average invocation time is around 580 milliseconds. So it's not as dramatic as the improvement we saw with the early initialization. However, it's non-trivial. I mean, I'm saving, what, roughly, you know, somewhere around 10% of my overall invocation just by using async gate and parallelizing calls when I see that it's possible. So again, this is just another way for you to tune the overall performance of your Lambda to get the most out of it. All right, let's head back to the deck. Okay, so now we understand what we can do to structure the code inside our handlers and the initialization phase of our Lambda in order to get the best performance during execution. But let's talk about what we can do in order to minimize the impact of cold starts on our Lambdas. So first and foremost, .NET Runtime now supports the ability for you to use a feature called Ready to Run. And with Ready to Run, what you're effectively leveraging is essentially ahead of time compilation of the assemblies inside your .NET code. And what this enables you to do is skip an aspect of .NET, which is called the just-in-time compiler. What this does is it takes your code from the intermediate language that your C-sharp code gets compiled to and converts it into machine code that has been executed by the actual runtime. And if you leverage ready to run, what you're effectively doing is front loading that jitting process at the time that you're actually compiling your code. And this can actually have a dramatic impact to the startup time of your Lambda. It can be anywhere from you know 10 to 20 percent of the overall execution time of that cold start is simply spent loading your assemblies and getting them jitted so they can actually execute. Now, one thing to be aware of is in .NET Core or .NET, which is now the new branding versions prior to .NET 6, you did have to do that ready-to-run compilation in the same target environment that your code was going to be deployed to. And for Lambda, that means that you'd have to be compiling them with ready-to-run enabled in a Linux-based environment. The last thing to just be aware of is that when you do use ready to run, because it's actually generating the machine code for your assemblies, what it will do is actually bundle that generated machine code along with the actual intermediate language for your assemblies, and that's gonna result in a slightly larger assembly size. The reason that this matters is that, again, depending on how you're packaging up your Lambda, that does mean the size of your Lambda package or the image if you're using Docker images is gonna be slightly larger due to the fact that you're bundling both that pre-compiled code along with your intermediate language code. Now, another way to try and address cold starts is to use a relatively new feature that we've added to Lambda. It's called provision concurrency. And the whole idea with provision concurrency is you're instructing the Lambda service to actually pre-warm a few instances of your Lambda ahead of time before any execution of the code is being requested by an outside event source. And what this al allows you to do is preload a lot of the code that would normally be get spent spinning up a brand new instance and have that done with the provision concurrency infrastructure. So at the time that an incoming request comes in, a Lambda is already standing by and waiting to get executed. Now, in environments that are very you know, user intensive, where you want to be able to return from a request very quickly, provision concurrency is a fantastic way to be able to provide very low latency numbers and provide your users with a great user experience. Using provision concurrency will require no changes to your Lambda code itself. All you'll do is just change the configuration of the Lambda function to leverage provision concurrency. And all you do is you identify what version or alias you'd like to have provision concurrency enabled on, you tell provision concurrency how many instances or what the concurrency limit is that you'd like to have for that function, and then Lambda will then deploy that number of instances for you. So let's take a look at a demo for how we can leverage provision concurrency to reduce that latency. All right, we're back to our development box. And the next demo I wanna look at is how to use provision concurrency to mitigate cold start time.
Now, in this case, I've got a Lambda um, that's actually leveraging Entity Framework to access some data in a database. For those of you who have not used Entity Framework in the past, it can be a little slow the very first time you spin up your DB context, and in a Lambda, that can actually dramatically impact your cold start performance. And so what I've done is I've got an implementation of my Lambda. In this example, there is no difference in the actual code of my Lambda, and instead, what I'm going to do is deploy two versions of my Lambda, one that uses provision concurrency and one that does not. And if you actually look in my serverless template, we can actually see how that is implemented. So I've got my first one that's using an on-demand or not perform uh, provision concurrency. But if you scroll down a little bit lower, you'll see I have an, an implementation of my Lambda that does have provision concurrency enabled. In this case, I've asked Lambda to spin up five instances of my Lambda function so that when someone invokes my Lambda, there's probably going to be an instance that's already been pre-warmed and is standing by to handle invocations. Uh, again, what I've done is I've provisioned these into CloudFormation, so I'm going to go ahead and click on my provision concurrency stack, and I will go to the outputs. And let's go ahead and invoke our URLs. So I'll go ahead and hit the on demand. This is the one that's going to have a cold start. Great. And now let's actually go ahead and go back to Visual Studio and we'll hit my provisioned endpoint. Now, you may have noticed that came back near instantaneously. Let's go ahead and compare both of these inside the X ray service map. So to do that, I'll go to Visual Studio and then I'll click on my X-Ray service map link. Now, just as before, I'll go ahead and make this a little bit smaller just so you can compare these two side by side. And again, you can actually see a very dramatic you know, difference in size of the nodes. And again, just for completeness sake, the size is being is reflecting the latency of the invocations. And this has only been on one invocation of my Lambda, so it's going to indicate cold start time. So let's take a look at the on-demand. In this case, it took 4.12 seconds for me to invoke that Lambda on the very first invocation. Let's compare that to the impact on provision concurrency. If we expand that, we'll see it's 47 milliseconds. So it's a dramatic decrease and a dramatic improvement for the customer experience for someone who's hitting that API for the first time. So again, you know, I strongly encourage you to leverage the other techniques we've been discussing so far in order to try and improve your Lambda's performance. But in the event that you find something that's completely unavoidable, but you still want to give your customers a superior end user experience, provision concurrency can be a fantastic way to provide that experience. All right, let's get back to the deck. All right, so the last couple of things I wanted to talk about or just a few hints for how to structure your code and your execution environment in order to get the most out of your serverless architectures. So the first thing is somewhat related to what we were talking about earlier with early initialization, and that is caching of data. So whenever possible, try to find ways to remove code that is fetching the same sets of data over and over again. Because after all, code that doesn't execute is the fastest code ever. Uh, and to help with that, we've got a number of different ways to do that kind of data caching. There's a great service called ElastiCache. You can provide either a Memcached or a Redis implementation, and you can have your Lambda actually fetching data from that shared cache during its execution, and only when there's a cache miss, actually execute the code that's necessary to go fetch that data. Now, one thing I do want to point out is if you are using ElastiCache, these are VPC hosted resources. So you will need to ensure that the configuration of your Lambda is including VPC connectivity so that your Lambda will have an Elastic network interface attached to it. And like we were talking about earlier, uh, you can leverage that initialization phase to go and fetch data like we were showing in the demo, parameters, secrets, what have you. But you can also build lookup tables that your code may be using. So instead of having to dynamically calculate things, you can have pre-calculated sets of data in order to accelerate the actual speed of your handler. And then the last thing that you can use, and this is kind of a brown or black belt trick, is that you can use in-memory caching inside the Lambda environment itself. Because uh, after all, 
your Lambda instance is actually a virtual machine that's running your code, and so it has access to all the data that was used in a previous invocation of your Lambda. Just be aware that that in-memory cache is going to be uh, specific to that particular instance of your Lambda. And depending upon how many incoming re requests are coming in, what the degree of parallelization looks like, your next incoming request may not hit the exact same Lambda. So use this with caution, but it is a nice way for you to be able to pre-calculate and store some data, even in memory, without needing to uh, you know, use a service like ElastiCache. Now, another thing that I wanted to point out is that, you know, when people are first learning Lambda, you know, as you can see, by setting the amount of memory that you allocate to your Lambda, you're also uh, allocating the amount of CPU resources it has access to. But when people look at that memory allocation, they're also paying very close attention to the fact that Lambda is charged per gigabyte second. So the amount of memory you allocate is also seemingly going to result in how much you're paying for that Lambda infrastructure. However, again, like I mentioned earlier, the amount of memory that you allocate to your Lambda also gives it access to more CPU, which means it can also execute faster, which means a shorter duration of your Lambda code, which correspondingly means that you may actually pay less for the Lambda at a higher memory allocation than you would at a lower one. And this graph that I'm, or chart that I'm showing you here uh, comes from a test run where I've got a, a Lambda function that brute forces prime numbers from one to one million a hundred times. And as you can see, based on the memory allocation of that Lambda, it's gonna take a certain amount of time to execute because again, it only has so much CPU resources. So at 256 megabytes of memory allocation, it takes around 15 seconds to allocate, which costs around, you know, 0.6 cents you know, to run. On the other hand, you'll notice if I allocate a gig of memory to my Lambda, which is four times as much, so you'd think you'd pay four times as much for the execution, it actually executes in almost a fifth of the amount of time that it did at 256 meg. So I actually end up paying slightly less to execute that code under a gig. Uh, and obviously, depending on the structure of your Lambda, you're, you may find that you're doing compute intensive tasks that can also benefit from this approach. Another way to test this sort of thing, rather than doing brute force like I did with that chart, is to actually use a great open source tool uh, that's been provided. Uh, one of my colleagues, Alex Castelboni, has actually created AWS Lambda Power Tuning. This is an open source project that we also provide through the serverless application repository. And it's a great way for you to actually measure your performance over a wide variety of configurations of your Lambda function. And what you'll do is while you're configuring it, you'll simply provide a set of memory allocations that you'd like to test how many times you want to test that memory allocation. And then the Lambda power tuning tool can even render a graph to help you understand what the relation between the speed of execution and the cost of that Lambda execution will look like. So let's actually take a look at a demo for how to use that power tuning tool in practice. OK, the final demo of this session is going to be taking a look at how power tuning actually works in practice. So in this case, I've got a C-sharp Lambda. Uh, this one is just a simple implementation where I'm doing a brute force calculation of all of the primes from 1 to 1 million, and I'm doing that 100 times. Now, the nice thing about power tuning, like I mentioned before, is that is it is a serverless application, and we've actually registered it in the serverless application repository. And what this means for you, the developer, is that you can actually incorporate it into the serverless templates for your applications. So as you can see here, I'm leveraging the serverless application resource inside my serverless application model template. I'm giving it the location of the AWS power tuning tool. And I'm just, in this case, I'm using the most recent version as of the time of this recording, which is 4.1.2. Then what I'm doing is I'm deploying the Lambda function that's got my brute force calculation of all the primes. And again, I'm just telling it to go from you know one to one million during that calculation. Now, what 
power tuning will do again is it'll actually do a Monte Carlo analysis of my lambda by trying different configurations of the lambda and invoking it. And the way it works is it creates a state machine and then you give it a payload that indicates the number of tests at each kind of configuration and what different configurations to probe. And what I've done just to make my life a little bit easier is I've actually expressed the values for configure of the power tuning tool as output variables on my serverless template just to make this demo go a little bit more smoothly. So what I'll do is I'm going to copy the body of my state machine input for the power tuning tool. Let me just grab this copy of this here. And then I will click the link that will snap me directly to the power tuning state machine. Now, in order to actually use the power tuning tool, you simply click the start execution button. And what it will do is present you with an input box where you can actually upload the payload that describes the uh, configuration that you want to use for your test runs. So in this case, what I will do is replace the JSON in there with the JSON I just copied. In my case, I'm going to tell it to try a few different configurations of memory, everywhere from 256 meg all the way up to 4 gig. Uh, I'd like for it to run each configuration about 10 times in order to get a good you know, analysis of that. And in this case, I'm telling it, hey, when you're doing that, optimize for the, uh, the cost over performance ratio. So let's go ahead and start the execution of our state machine. Now, since this is an online recording, I'm actually going to leverage the power of video editing just so you don't have to sit here and wait for the overall execution to take place. So I'll see you on the other side. Okay, so we're back, and as we can see, it took about a little, um, little less than three minutes to run the full execution. The primary reason for that is that this is a very compute-intensive Lambda, and I told it to go all the way down to 256 meg, which gave it just a fraction of a CPU to run that code, which was the long tentpole on the overall execution time. Now, if we look at the output of the power tuning tool, it's going to give me a, a few pieces of information. First, it's going to tell me what it thinks its recommendation is on the right size for my Lambda based on the strategy I told it to optimize for. It'll also tell me what the cost is you know, per invocation at that configuration. It'll also tell me the length of time it took for my simulations to run. But one of the really cool features of power tuning is that it can actually give me a graph that helps me understand what that looks like in a visual format. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and navigate to that URL. And what we see is a nice graph that gives me a way to visualize you know, how the execution looked and what the performance of my Lambda looked like at the different memory configurations. And what you can see is the best cost, so the best price performance ratio for my Lambda is when I uh, use the 1024 or 1 gig memory allocation for it. Uh, that gives me roughly a cost of around, uh, you know, what is it, 0 0.062 cents per invocation of my Lambda. So hopefully what you can see is that this can be a very, very useful tool, not only for designing, you know, the configuration of your lambdas, but one other aspect that I wanted to point out is that the power tuning tool not only can be incorporated into your cloud formation templates, but you can actually have it apply the price performance ratio or the best performance uh, you know, number that it determines during the test phase for you automatically. So I'm going to restate that. The power tuning tool can not only be used in this very human interactive kind of way, but it can automatically optimize your Lambda code so that you can get either the best price performance ratio or the best overall performance for your Lambda given a range of memory configurations to try. So I strongly recommend that you try out this tool for your own performance tuning. All right, let's get back to the deck. Great. So one of the last things I wanted to mention was just recently, as of a couple of months ago, we've su started supporting the ability to run your Lambdas on Graviton2. So for those of you who aren't aware of it, Graviton2 is an ARM64 processor architecture that was actually designed and implemented by AWS. 
And one of the great things about .NET Core code is that it can run on a wide variety of processor architectures, including ARM64. And in fact, the Microsoft team responsible for the .NET runtime has done a great job optimizing performance of .NET Core code on the ARM64 platform. Now, in general, what we find customers who are executing Lambda code on ARM64 instead of x86 or x64 code are getting around a 20% savings over that in x86 infrastructure. And if you look at the pricing that we have for Lambda functions, you'll see, again, it's by gigabyte second. And for x86, you know, it's about, again, 20% more to run on that. However, what you really should do is test your workload. Try it out with different implementations, use different processor architectures. It's simply a configuration on your Lambda as to which processor architecture you're deploying your code to, and verify your code. Use technologies like CloudWatch, like X-Ray, just in order to measure how well your code is performing on those, and you may very well find that you're actually getting a much better performance profile by targeting the ARM64 runtime. And this is just an example uh, of the exact same function I was talking about earlier, where I'm doing that brute force calculation of about those prime numbers. And this is actually an interesting data point. So you'll notice at the 1024, you know, the one gig memory allocation, x86 slightly edges out the ARM64 infrastructure when it comes to the, the price per performance ratio. However, you'll notice uh, if I actually give the ARM64 environment slightly more memory and compare that against the corresponding x86 architecture, I'm starting to find that my ARM64 environment is actually getting a better price performance ratio. Well, why is that? Well, it just so happens with our ARM64 or Graviton2 processor architecture, we have cores for our CPUs directly tied to these CPUs. This is unlike the Intel execution environment where a vCPU is actually leveraging hyperthreading. So for Intel, a single core can actually handle two vCPUs, whereas with Graviton2, we've actually got a core per vCPU, and you can find that as you allocate more vCPUs, your underlying Lambda code has access to more raw performance power. Okay, so the last couple of things I just wanted to point out before we wrap up are just some key takeaways here. So number one, you can achieve very significant performance improvements just by understanding the way Lambda is going to execute your code and refactoring your code in order to take advantage of that. Next is whenever possible, find ways to leverage parallelism. So if you're invoking multiple underlying AWS services, if you're executing like multiple database queries that are independent of one another, leverage the task infrastructure in .NET in a sync weight in order to have those tasks actually executing in parallel with one another as opposed to waiting for them to sequentially execute. Uh, always, always look at ways to instrument your code, leverage technologies like X-Ray in order to monitor your code, even look at using technologies like CloudWatch Synthetics just to actually continually measure the performance of your code. Optimization is a continuous process, and over time as your code changes, you want to make sure you're aware of how those changes impact the overall performance of your Lambda. And the way to do that is by gathering instrumentation that gives you those metrics. Again, you know, you might consider moving to the Graviton2 platform and ARM64 infrastructure just so you can get a better price performance ratio of your code. But again, for all the things that we've been talking about in this session, you really, really, really need to test your code. Incorporate ways to actually do performance metrics as part of your deployment infrastructure. Use technologies like AWS Power Tuning to actually dynamically evaluate the performance of your code. And you can even use tools like Power Tuning to automatically optimize the lambdas based on the test data that it collects at the time of deployment. All right, so before we wrap up, I just wanted to point out there are a few related sessions regarding this topic, uh, and I strongly recommend that you go and view these. These are great topics regarding high-performance.net as well as high-performance Lambda infrastructures. All right, thank you so much for attending this session. I hope this was valuable to you, and we can't wait to see what you build on AWS.